lesson. We're going to continue with 1 Corinthians, and we're going to wrap up our discussion of chapter 5, verse 1, before we move into uh, the, the interesting verses to follow that. And we end last week's lesson by beginning to look at these two questions. As Paul is talking about this, he says in chapter 5, verse 1, New International Version, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife. And we looked at the scriptural foundation for Paul's uh, statement, and we discussed the influence, why he said, why he referred to Roman society. And if he was using Roman society as a way of helping to define, you know, the church's stance on things, then we, we clarify that certainly that isn't the case. But the last section of that is that, is he ranking sin here? And it leads to the question, does God rank sin? And then, of course, is Paul ranking sin? Now, we began to look at this part of it last week. Does God rank sin? And... Really, no, he doesn't. We looked at uh, 1 John chapter 3 where he talks about murder, as well as Revelation 21, 8 where he says all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. So one is just as bad as the other as far as sin being sin before God. There isn't a white sin or, or black sin or gray sin or, you know, like that. Sin is sin. So, along with that, why do you think we have then passages where God talks about sins that are abomination to him and sins in which he hates? And along this, there are some sexual sins that fall into that category. And here, pride is something that he hates and those two words could, you know, which, which is worse than the other. I, if God hates it, it's an abomination to him. If it's an abomination to it, he hates it. I, you know, it's kind of six one, six, of, six one half dozen of the other. But pride is something that he hates as well as certain types of sexual sin. So if God doesn't rank sin, why does he use these phrases, you think? in scripture and it leads to our second question as we look at that. I think humans are in sin. Okay. It's our nature to have to. I think we think of it in terms of the consequences. <clears throat> A person would think killing somebody is worse than every reason. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at it from God's standpoint, sin is sin. Uh, but from our standpoint, certainly, we, we rank it. There's no question that we rank sin. That's where the phrase white lies came up. It's from us as human beings. Uh, God just calls it a lie. He calls humans. That's what I'm saying. I think you rank Yeah. And yeah, I, I, think, I think that does lead right to this, that Paul is ranking <clears throat> He is ranking sin here. And, and it's not just because Paul hated incest worse than any other sin. It's not, it's not that uh, simply put. But Paul is ranking sin because of the consequences of what certain sins do to the people who practice them as well as to those who are affected by them. And I think that's where, you know, as Paul says, you know, this is a sin that even the pagans don't find acceptable. So why bring this out? Because of the nature of, of the testimony that that sin produces and the consequences of those sins to the individual and to the body. And Stacy is here and she has pound cake over there. It's getting, 
it's got all the major food groups in it. So it I mean, does. you know, so help yourself to some pound cake. It won't. It won't. It's warm. I just took it out. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Bill, Bill can hang up teaching now for next ten minutes. But y'all, y'all have to sell. It, it will not, it will not bother me. So, but Paul does rank sins because of the impact of the testimony before unbelievers, and this is interesting. Paul is saying how unbelievers. And it was certainly that incest did not occur in Roman society. It did. It did occur. But how unbelievers who do the same thing see those sins and those claiming a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're, we're going to see this whole thing come up again and again through chapter 5, chapter 6. We'll see it as we move on into the rest of the book. And we will visit this several times, but Paul ranks in because of the impact, because of the testimony, how it affects the testimony of a believer, of a church. So to God, it's all bad. There isn't some bad, some worse, and some really bad. No, it's all bad. It didn't take one sin to get us all in trouble in the Garden of Eden. But when you talk about how we live in this world, the impact, the testimony, that's where we see the ranking of this. Question, comment on that. So Paul is going to comment on other sins as he goes on in the letter. We'll see this as we get into chapter 5. But from an earthly testimonial and spiritually impactful point of view for believers, this sin, which was incest, was especially heinous. Now, what do we do about it? Verse 2. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. And I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. First part of chapter, uh, verse 6. So, as we look at this, I want us to take time as we examine these verses and just kind of walk through them. So, what was the church's response? What was the church's response? The Corinthians response. Are well, you talking about this man? Yeah. Okay. What was their response? The church is doing to, what we continue to do today. We overlook it. Sounds almost like they're proud of me. Yeah, and you are proud. He said that in verse, verse 2. And you are proud. This is something that even pagans know you, and you're proud about it. Sounds weird. Yeah, it does. What else? How else does how else does this does the response strike you? They overlooked it. They were proud. Excused it. <coughs> accepted it. <coughs> Now, it's interesting as we look at this. Here was, on one hand, pride and acceptance. Overlooked, proud, excused, accepted. That was how they were looking at this, the nature of what this man was doing. Versus what Paul is advocating of grief, 
mourning, being upset, and separation. Now, we don't know who this offender was. Name is not given. Or what position this person held within that body of believers, if he held any. Some commentators note that he may have been a patron. In other words, a financial supporter of the church. And, of course, being somebody who financially supported the church, had some deep pockets, the church just kind of overlooked, was proud, excused, accepted his sinfulness as a freedom, as a believer saved by grace. Or, as we've already noted, the church was proud of their liberty even though they knew this was wrong. They were still proud. We can do this. We are better than Paul. We are better than what he has first preached to us. Look at what we can do, and we're still good. That's why Paul says it is actually reported. You claim to be all this in verse 8 uh, of chapter 4, but this is what's actually being talked about. So we don't know who the man was. The woman is not mentioned. Stepmother's not mentioned, other than this man has his father's wife. Uh, and she's not addressed in the response of the church. Why do you think that is? She may not have been a believer. May not even been part of the church. And she could have been very, very, she could have been good with the situation. Maybe she was glad of it, but we don't know. You know, it's, it's not reported. And this isn't a singular event, you know. The situation was a continuing practice that was going on. As we talked about that a man has, that the verb tense there is present, that he, he has, is, and is continuing to have his father's wife. So, this wasn't just a one-time event where all of a sudden, you know, somebody found out about something that someone failed in, and now we jump on. And look at Paul's approach to this situation. Who is the you to which he's referring? You. You. Who is the you? The body. The body. <coughs> Congregation, body, church. <coughs> That's the you that he's talking about. Paul approaches this situation of this man with living in incest from the standpoint of how it's impacting and how it should impact the body of believers. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about this. Does does the church today handle let's use that word sin within the congregation now is that a can of worms or what you feel good churches I'm oh. So, it's, it's rare that it's in, the, in very few churches. Really. I mean, I just see it. And I've seen it here. Very few. I've seen it. And it happens. A lot of times, if you bring up something that you know for a fact is wrong, that someone is doing, you will become the one that's attacked not the person that's in the wrong. 
think the more common so you keep quiet. Yeah, I think the yeah. more common way to step with is through preaching the truth more so than uh, from that perspective, you know how people are. If they're offended, they're gonna leave. You know, that happens. Yeah. And, and and that's an interesting point. We'll come back and look at that. That the the ease with which people can now leave a congregation and go to another one. That you know is is. It's like they go to find what they want to hear, and that's where they stay. Yeah. And Paul talked about this in Second Timothy that there will come a time in the last days people will have they will seek ministry and and preaching because they have itchy ears. Whatever will that accommodates them is what they will go not for the standard of the truth. So it truly seems that the church as an institution has lost some of this focus on unity and collective togetherness in looking at the issues that face it. We have built, we've been successful in, especially in the West and in other places. I mean, at one time there was a church in South Korea that had 500,000 members. You know, it was in Seoul, Korea. And we built massive congregations with multiple ministers, ministries, so forth. And with all of that, and as successful as all of that looks, and I'm not kicking those things, but at the same time, it seems like it's easy then to lose the sense of community that we need to have when something arises. It's easy to, to be so far over here and in your little group, especially in a very large church, that you, you, don't, you may not even hear of something. And you're separated from that. Paul was not asking for a few people to look at this. He says you, as the church, are proud. And he says, shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief? So, what do you think about that statement? Filled with grief and put out of your fellowship the man who did this. How does that strike you? Yeah. Is it a believer that's just gone in the wrong way? Doesn't recognize look into that he is. Said he is. So so if he is a believer, then being separated from other believers, <clears throat> will that drive him back? You know what I'm saying? Almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of Yeah, because you know, Paul Paul is taking a very firm stand here. Now he's talking about incest, which is a, a serious sin. Once again, Paul is ranking this. Paul's not questioning salvation. The man is saved. Yeah, he, he, never, he, he didn't. He didn't. We, he didn't go into that because that goes back to the motives yeah. and the intents yeah. of the heart, and only God knows that. So if you love him, there's there's a lovingness coming from God, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he chastises every son whom he receives. If we do not fall, as Hebrews says, if we don't get chastised from the Lord, well, we're not one his. Of him coming back. Yeah. So, is Paul being too harsh here? No. But we've already said that most churches don't do this. Why do we not? Because well, it don't affect me. I'm not getting in it. I'm not getting in it. It ain't my. It ain't my dog fight. <laughs> I'll leave it up to the preacher to deal with that. I thought we pay him the big money for you, you know. Because, because we all have sin. Mm -hmm. 
we don't want to cross that line. Hey, he pops post, he's going to come back and get Sean Paul too. Who's going to buy the line? Post people's and, 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 that's, and that's a point that we want to look at. Paul is saying to the church, he says, you as a body, as a church, as a congregation, you need to deal with this. But at the same time, we all have sin. So, is Paul saying now just because you haven't committed this particular sin, like incest, you have the right to jump on somebody even though we're all guilty of sins? How can he, how can he do that? Are we now becoming a group of, you know, perfectionists because... Well, we we you know we didn't have we hadn't sinned like that. You have, and we're going to get on you. Well, but at the same time, we all have sin. How do we balance this? How do we how, you know how does Paul expect the church to deal with this? Because this show wasn't the only problem Corinth had. That, that's the trick: the balance between that and accepting everything. I mean, most churches have become the accepter. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to offend anyone for heaven's sake. So let's just let's just not say nothing and we'll let it go. And let's now, live and let live. And now, now you see where we are. And maybe that's what Corinth was saying. But look at what Paul says. You should have been filled with grief. You should have. It should have upset you that you have a member of your congregation that is openly, outwardly living this type of lifestyle. This ain't a, a single failure. This was a life practice, a lifestyle, a consistent thing that he was doing. And he said, you ought to put that person out. How do we deal with that? How do we, how do we balance that? How do we go with that? And Paul said that he's really settled in his decision. Look at what he says. Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. I've already passed judgment. The next time you get together as a body of people, hand this man over to the devil. But see, God don't break sin. No. So he's going to do that for the guy that just loved him, over ate, took the Lord's name in vain. God can work down with that judgment. Yeah. Well, and that, that's why we're going to spend the time with it. It's because we all have sin. We all have problems, if you will. We all have failures. So... Why is Paul harping, and that's, you know, we can use that phrase here for sake of discussion. Why is Paul harping on this and telling the church, kick this man out? Sometimes you make an example, that next one will happen. Okay, you have an example. Well, Ananias and Sapphira was a great example. Mm -hmm. They liked the Holy Spirit and brought God's fucking dead as a result. And I, and I am glad God, God doesn't do that now. <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here this morning probably. You know. And probably none of us would be in the room here if God you know. That's probably, did you not say this guy was a patron of the church? Well, it's possible. We, we don't know, but he was, he was probably, well, we don't know. It, it's been just surmised. So no better example than the rest of the church. And this failure, the, the acceptance of this failure is another evidence of that arrogance that the church had. Now, Paul isn't talking about the motives of this man's heart. We, we pointed that out a while ago. Only God can judge whether the man is truly a believer or not. It seems that he was, although you can kind of wonder, but... But it's not the motive of the man's heart that's the problem. It's his behavior that is sinful. 
and that has to be dealt with by the church. Whatever this man's motive was is really quite irrelevant. There's no way in Paul's mind that this sin could be excused by some declaration of good motives. Or even if he was a Christian. Well, he's a believer. He's saved. But, and that goes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier. Testimony. Yes, he might be a Christian, but his testimony... And the church's testimony for doing nothing about this is hindering the message of the gospel going out into that Corinthian community. Because that's what they're talking about. That's what they're talking about. Do you know what's going on down at first Corinth? You know. That's the impact you're making. Yeah, that's what they're Now they could have all other kind of good stuff happening. But this, because it was ongoing and the church was accepting, excusing, proud, overlooking what this man was doing. And that also leads to the fact that maybe he was a man of some standing because if he was a slave who was a Christian and doing this, the community probably wouldn't have said a thing. Maybe. Although, sinners will try to find something to jump on the church about regardless of how small it may be. Jim? Yes, sir. I knew a person that didn't say and he did, but I still think there are consequences behind it. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. There is. There is. <clears throat> and the consequence in this case for the church, as Paul says, the next time when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus and I am with you in spirit, and the power of the Lord Jesus is present. Hand this man over to Satan. So, good question. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. I want to touch on one other thing before we get to that. In matters of clear, open sin. <clears throat> Now, we've already said Paul wasn't judging the man's motives. He was judging his behavior. So in matters of clear, open sin, can those behaviors, actions, ever how you want to define that, be excused, overlooked, or ignored with the blanket that the person meant well? Can we excuse somebody simply because, well, He's got a good heart. I can say whether we do it or not, should we do it? Because we do do it. thing go and we oftentimes use the phrase though you know because somebody meant well we just kind of overlook things but there are several examples in the Old Testament that that bring out very clearly that you just can't always do that for Samuel chapter 13 Samuel had told Saul right after he had established 
you know, had him anointed as king over Israel, Israel's first king. He said, I want you to go and you go wait seven days and I'm going to be there. I'm going to offer an, an sacrifice and then you fight the Philistines. Well, verses 7 through 14 of 1 Samuel 13 gives us the account of Saul's perception of his dilemma. He waited to what he thought was the time of seven days. Samuel wasn't there. And some of his soldiers were beginning to desert. They were beginning to leave in the face of the, of the enemy. So Saul steps into the priest's office and offers a sacrifice so they could go ahead and fight. And that could be described as a good motive. Because this is when Samuel said, what have you done? Saul explains and he said, well, you know, you weren't here and everybody was leaving and people were getting upset. So I just, I forced myself, is what he says. And I offered a sacrifice. I had a good motive. My heart was good. Samuel said, you've lost the kingdom. He didn't have the authority to do it. No. Samuel said, you've lost the <clears throat> This action... Regardless of whatever motive you say you have, so this action has cost you your kingship. Then in chapter 15, remember that's with Agag. The Lord had told Saul to go kill all of the Amalekites, everything, slay it all, even their animals. But Saul kept the best of the animals, and here's was, here was his motive to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But you remember verse 22 of that same passage says, you know, to obey is better than to sacrifice. In matters of clear, open sin, and we have to, and we have to pay attention to those words. Because we all have sin. And we're all guilty. Every day of something that we trip up in. But in matters of clear, open sin, persistent, unrepentant sin, they cannot be covered by any kind of spiritual motive and they have to be acknowledged for what they are. They are sin and they need to be dealt with. Now, oftentimes we, from a worldly point of view, will understand why somebody does something. There's a passage in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 and verse 31. It says, if a man is hungry and steals, people understand that, but he'll still have to pay the price. So even though we may say, okay, I understand why you did thus and so, but that's still wrong, and there still has to be a penalty for that. And it doesn't mean that we are that we are perfectionists, that we are clean in the sense that we don't have failures. But once again, when you have a breach, and it's a very clear or egregious breach, as in this case here, chapter 5, that has to be dealt with. When there's clear, open, persistent, unrepentant sin, the church has an obligation based upon this chapter that you've got to act and do something about it. So Paul says, when you come together, you need to unite and as a body act on this issue. Now, it's interesting that Paul didn't say, I want the, the leader of the church to deal with this. You know, We'll put him up there. Whatever the consequences that he takes, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be good, you know, I'm fine, let him deal with it. Now, Paul says, you. So he didn't just say for one or two or three people in a position to deal with this. And he's not advocating mob action either. Now, that's, that's the two sides of this that we have to be careful of. But it is an action of the collective body based upon clear information 
opportunity having been extended for repentance. And then if no change, bring before the body for open transparency and deal with it. Now, is this easy? No. Will people's emotions be involved? Yes. This, is, this, this was going to be messy in this congregation. No less than it would be messy if we had a similar situation that we had to deal with in our congregations today. But it's the testimony of the body that is at stake. And that body's fellowship with God is at risk if they do not address it. And this is why Paul exhorts the church body to act here. It isn't a, about one person being guilty of something just as bad, but passing judgment on somebody else's sin. It's about the united body acknowledging that sin has occurred within the body and they must deal with it as the sinner is not repentant of their fault. Evidently, this man and the church too was proud of what they were doing. Neither one of them wanted to hear about repenting and changing your way of living. Stop doing what you're doing. Neither one of them wanted to hear that. And Paul said when you have that type of situation, the church needs to act. You need to put that guy out. Okay? Questions, comments? I see a lot of, like, mm, on people's faces here. And that's all right. This is not an easy section of Scripture. That's why I process it, talk about it. We're going to get to that hand, hand this man over to Satan. We're going to talk about what he actually is talking about here, too. So, yeah. We're going to get to it. I think if the churches today took a stand against sin like that, people might be more inclined to think before they acted if they knew that they would have to be held responsible for it by their church. But at the same time, you're giving the church such power that they could get prideful themselves and mm -hmm. start yep. including other things that maybe shouldn't be addressed. Yeah. Bring up a good point. The risk is vanity by the, by the body, mm -hmm. and I, and you do get to that mob mentality. Then whoever can sway the body, they can control whatever is going on, and that ain't right. But at the same time, we do not trust each other to do the right thing. Why do churches not take a stronger stand on some of these? Maybe a lot of reasons. But these are two big ones here. Because people do get things. You know, once you give somebody an authority or power, the temptation then is to overexert that power or authority. And there's been scientific research and all that stuff. You can go right down the line and see where all this bounces out. And it's true spiritually. There are few things as dangerous as spiritual pride and spiritual vanity and spiritual arrogance. There are few things that can be any more dangerous than that. But we're going, we're going, and we're going to come back to this again. We're going to see this come up again within this church. They didn't trust each other to do the right thing. I'm going to stay out of it. Ain't my fight. Because I don't know if you people do the right thing or not, so I'm just going to have to step over here out of the way. 
You do what you got to do, but mm, I'm just not sure whether you'll do the right thing or not. But what does this say to us as a congregation? Once again, the you, the body. If we don't trust each other, if we haven't evidenced in our life enough for people to trust us to do the right thing in a serious situation, hmm, what does that say about us? I'm, I'm talking to us. I ain't talking at you. I'm talking, you know, if I go this way, there's a whole bunch of other things that's pointing this way. So, but I ain't pointing at you. I'm just saying, what does that say about us? If we as believers, we all love Jesus. We all going to serve God. We're all saved. Dude, I don't trust him any further than I can throw him. What does that say? What does that say about our testimony? What does that say about who we are? I mean, you know, it's, it's a question I think we have to, we have to come to grips with in ourselves. We'll come back to this. This is going to crop up again in Corinth. This is going to crop up again. Now, Paul says, you need to do something about this. And this is what he says you need to do. At your next gathering, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Now, that's NIV. I think King James says, such, a, such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And that really, the King James is a little more literal translation than the NIV on this. So, the remedy. And over to Satan, I think my hand is about to die on the gear, so I'll switch and go back to the number. Hand over to Satan for destruction of the sinful nature, flesh. So, What's Paul talking about doing? What, what, what does that mean? So what what is the how do you hand somebody over to the devil? And what does it mean for the destruction of the Basically saying, put, put him out of your fellowship and let him do what he wants to do. Okay. Excommunicate and let the chips fall. Okay. Bill? Yes, sir. Does Paul the anointed one to do this? Absolutely. He told the church to do it. He said they are anointed to do this. Paul was telling the church, he said, now when you come together as a body, I'm present with you in spirit. Because I'm not with you there physically, but I'm, 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 I'm supporting you, I'm backing you in my spirit. But you as a body, you have the anointing to put this man out. So he was, he was saying, I'm not putting the man out, I'm telling you to put this man out. So... One way of understanding hand over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh is to excommunicate. Some commentators, and we touched on this the other, other week, that what, was, what Paul was giving here is a curse death uh, declaration. And this was this is like what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Remember when they came and you know Peter asked and said, um, "Did you give such and such money? And yeah, was this all that you said? Yeah, this is everything we gave. No, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Boom, God dies, and then he asked Sapphira when she come in, did you know? Yes, and said the people who just took your husband out coming to get you. Bam, she falls over dead. It's a it's a curse death judgment is what some commentators call this. 
Now, the Greek word for destruction here is a very strong word. It, it's actually a word denoting utter ruin. And so there's, there's some debate over this. I lean toward the fact that he's talking about excommunication because he says in verse 13 of chapter 5, expel the wicked man from among you. So I think he's not, he's not saying that the church has the authority to, to put a curse on somebody for them to die. I don't think he's saying that at all. I think what he is saying is that the church has the authority and the right to expel this man and certainly let the chips fall where they will. Let the consequences of his life choices take place so that he learn and that his soul may be saved at the day of the Lord. And it could, be, it could be debated as to whether the man was truly saved or whether he was unsaved. But once again, that's motives that we have to leave with God. Only God knows for sure. And we could debate it all day. But let's give him the, the, the benefit of being saved. Is Paul saying now he's going to lose his salvation with this? No. No. Paul adds that with the hope of this expulsion, the public expulsion, that his spirit might be saved. So what you're saying, you can pray for him, but you don't have to run around with him? Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Paul's saying essentially, hey, no, you don't love him enough to let him get rock bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Probably you've got a lot of people that would say today, well, are you really loving that person? You really support them, but really by creating that false support and not letting them, you know, mm -hmm. get to the point where they know they need to repent. You're really just kind of ushering them down the road to hell instead of letting them. Yeah, you're in, in, in one of the phrases we use in today's language parlance is, you know, we're enabling somebody. Yeah. Yeah. We're enabling someone. And Paul is saying you definitely are not to enable someone to continue in open sin. You have to deal with it, especially if they're, if they're not trying to get over it. If they're not trying to get free from it, then you have to for sake of testimony. Not that we're greater than they are, not that we're better than they are, but because we have a testimony that has to be offered to the community and to others, we have to maintain certain standards. And really, I, I think that's where you get into that fine line. It is. Since yeah. you said that, okay, we implement God's law or man's law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something you've got to sit down and pray about. you got to get in the Bible. You've got to get some elders involved, man. You just don't know this. I mean, Excellent point. Tom Hall is like, hey, let's yeah. scream them up. Yeah. It know? goes right back to the point. We don't trust each other. We have to have people who have a connection with God. The implication is the church should be that group. If we're believers, we should be grounded. If we're believers, we should be prayed up. If we're believers, we should be able, because he's going to say in the next chapter, you need to take the people that are least esteemed in your church and make them a judge over people's civil litigation. I want the dirtiest lawyer I can find. Paul said, no. Get the least Christian in your church because that person should have a relationship with God so that they at least can know what's right and wrong. And you think chapter 5 is complicated. What can we get to chapter 6? I mean, that really, you know, begins to rub the fur the wrong way when you look in chapter 6. And we will get there. <coughs> So, rather than continuing to allow this man to continue in his present deception of faith, the church openly is to unmask him so that he can truly repent and get things right with this God. The man has defiled, Paul, I'm going to talk about this, he has defiled God's temple. Remember, he's already said, you are God's temple. He's defiled God's temple both physically and spiritually. His temple and the body of believers as the temple. 
And the church must act for its own strength of its relationship with God. And we'll talk about some examples that are in the New Testament when we get in verses 7 and 8 of just how we're supposed to, you know, why that's so important for us as a body. But it's 20 after, time to let you go. Thank you. Good conversation. We'll keep it up next week. Think about some things. Write some questions down, whatever. We'll, uh, we'll keep digging.